Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rebecca, and thank you to Deloitte for uh, hosting us here this morning in uh, your lovely uh, auditorium. Um, one of the biggest changes in, in governance in Whitehall in recent times has been the creation of what I think they were called supervisory boards at the time in uh, 2010 under the coalition government. And the fact that they are still with us uh, seven years and three governments later is in itself a measure of success in terms of uh, the longevity of uh, Whitehall uh, governance systems. Um, and we all know that uh, the, the boards in Whitehall are very different from a private sector board. But with our mission of cross-sector learning at WIG, uh, it's fascinating to hear about the uh, experience of private sectors in Whitehall, how they're working with the civil service and what they're learning from each other. So we're very lucky to have two people who are as well placed as anybody to tell us about that this morning. We've got uh, Ian Cheshire, who's chair of Debenhams and the lead non-executive for uh, government. He also sits on the cabinet office board and in the past he's uh, sat on the DWDP board as uh, lead non-executive. Uh, we've got with him uh, Sarah Weller, who's now on the DWP board as the lead non-executive and was previously on the uh, uh, DCLG board. And uh, in her spare time is also non-executive at Lloyds Banking Group and United Utilities. Uh, so they'll both speak for about uh, 10 minutes on their experiences and there'll then be the usual time for questions. So lots of questions uh, for them, please. Um, the speeches will be podcasts, so available to you afterwards as well. But the Q&A session will, as always, be under Chatham House, so please respect that. You can uh, use what you hear in that, but uh, don't attribute it either to the speakers or to the questioners. Uh, Rebecca's done the important uh, uh, air hostess announcements. The only other one I'd say, if you haven't done it already, please switch your mobile phone off or put it onto silent. And with that, over to Ian. Good morning. Um, that's good. This is on. Um, just do this from here. Um, Having presented in this room before, it's a choice of which end you stand in. So uh, we'll do the Q&A from over there, just sort of an advance warning. Um, I'm just going to spend um, a few minutes uh, really sort of scene setting about the overall um, system of non-execs in government, uh, as I see it at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> I spotted, I think, earlier on one of our uh, sort of colleagues I've now described from UCL who's doing a study on this. So we'll be uh, doing a much more authoritative uh, description of it later this year. Um, but I think it's important to give you a perspective, both from slightly my time at DWP um, before Sarah took over, um, but also uh, from where I've sort of seen the system evolve. And I suppose it's sort of th you know, three broad areas I'd like to talk about. One is the sort of the, if you like, the, the theory behind the system, both the genesis and maybe where it is now. Secondly, some observations about what works and doesn't work. Uh, and thirdly, the areas in which, as opposed to the department, involvement, which is what Sarah will talk much more about, uh, where the cross-cutting themes in government are that I think are true in different degrees for different boards. But just as a sort of quick reminder, um, the Whitehall has actually always had non-execs floating around it in various forms. Um, but traditionally, the pre-Francis uh, Maud model, I would describe it, was of non-execs being wheeled in on certain specific areas typically on a department board that was chaired by the perm sec, and typically in areas where there was deemed to be a sort of maybe possibly more of a private sector expertise uh, sort of need. And I think while that is, uh, was sort of definitely sort of welcomed and useful, when, when the initial idea of, of quote-unquote real boards was, was put forward by Francis, uh, there was quite a lot of, I think, fear and trepidation uh, amongst particularly the perm secs who thought the last thing they needed was a bunch of know-it-all private sector for people to come and tell them what to do. Um, and it's fair to say that I think if you press Francis Maud, he would tell you that actually this was really sort of the idea, was throw a hand grenade into Whitehall, uh, hire half the FTSE uh, CEO brigade, and try and basically shake everything up, which was very much of its time when the coalition was arriving and there was a sort of big push, notably on the deficit, and, and there has been a sort of massive restructuring of uh, the civil service. So 
this started in a certain place, and I think there was a certain sort of level of expectation maybe from politician and from civil servant. And for those of us that, uh, like myself, joined at that era, there wasn't an existing blueprint, and there was a sort of set of principles that wasn't really a well-developed um, thought about you know, what it was there for. And there were various ideas at one point about creating a formal um, legal basis for, for the non-execs and the departmental boards. Um, and I'm very glad that that wasn't pursued because I think it makes it much easier for the board to play a much more flexible role rather than having um, more accountability, which in between the accounting officer accountability and the ministerial responsibility, I think would just be frankly too difficult. So I think what has ended up evolving is a rather different system, and it's a much more triangular system than we've had before of independent non-exec, politician, and um, perm sec and, and civil service. And I think that system actually you know, plays out in different areas uh, differently, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, but actually fundamentally does help departments address the execution and running of, of uh, the department rather than the policy making of departments critical. Uh, in a way that is is a net addition to the system. And I would not overclaim for it. It has not solved Whitehall. It has not cured cancer. It has not done various other things. But is it a useful addition to the, to the machinery of government? I'm very convinced it is. And it has now evolved, I think, in, in a way that there's now some learning and a couple of, you know, arguably a couple of generations of non-execs who, like Sarah, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome back Sarah, who's now ser serving on her second lead role, um, who have got real experience of how to make this work effectively. So I think we now have a, a system that's understood. Um, two points on the system before I can talk about what works and doesn't work. What's very critical, and people don't seem to necessarily understand it, is it is chaired by the Secretary of State. If it's not chaired by the Secretary of State, the observation is it turns into a very tech area where the department understands that the, fundamentally the minister is not terribly interested in it. And as a result, it loses traction in the department. You absolutely have to do it. Now, there are some drawbacks on this, if, particularly if you've got a Secretary of State who hasn't ever ch used a board, let alone chaired one. So there are some ups and, ups and downs in that, but fundamentally you need to have that there. Secondly, I think you do need to recognise that the board is uh, an advisory board, not a NED PLC style board with, with oversight. There is a governance role, particularly in the audit committee. Audit and risk, I think, is a really critical sub-role of the board. But fundamentally, that board is advisory and is there to focus on how to improve the outcome of what the government's agenda is. It is not there to be uh, a sort of second SPAD. Um, to my mind, um, when we come to what's worked and what's not worked, um, again, two quick points. The government departments are astonishingly different. I mean, from my own perspective, having not really been involved in government before I got involved in DWP, uh, the difference between DCMS, DWP, MOD is, is sort of night and day in terms of the challenges, the scale, the types of issues they're dealing with. So it's not particularly surprising to my mind that the boards function in different ways depending on the different scale of the requirement. Um, but I think the other thing to overlay is that even allowing for the difference in departments, and I think you can particularly group big delivery departments look, are the things that look most like big PLCs, so the sort of DWP, MOJ end of the world, <coughs> uh, rather than the sort of pure, more policy end of the world. Um, but I think what you, what you then overlay is different, differential levels of engagement by ministers, and you have to be, just be pragmatic about this. Some people <coughs> are extremely engaged, uh, most uh, are properly engaged, and there's one or two outliers which we've seen in every cycle, and you, and you can't predict it by any particular attribute, it's just that some politicians are not as interested in, in the running of their department, frankly, and so they don't tend to use their boards as much or, or arguably as properly. Now, for the, for the board, what that means is <coughs> you use the board meetings as waypoints and structures to sort of give yourself a, an approval process through the year, but most of your work is not actually the board meeting. So four or five board meetings a year, I think, is actually fine because most of the, what you contribute as a non-exec is outside that. So you thematically have to work out what is, the, what is it that this particular department needs, where can I make a contribution, and a lot of it is about identifying the sort of Venn diagram of the skills you've got, the issues the department's got, and where's, where's the overlap, where can you really add value, uh, and, and that might that'll be very different. I, I you know, had a fantastic uh, contribution from David Lister when he was with me at DWP, he was the 
uh, head of systems for National Grid, so he knew quite a lot about big legacy systems, and that was incredibly helpful. <clears throat> in other places, we've seen some amazing contribution around arm's length bodies, which was much more of an issue for, for someone like DCMS. So I think the task varies, but the key thing is to say this is an agenda-led uh, sort of role. You have to work out where you can add value. It is not sitting around in board meetings for hours waiting for sort of minutes to, to come down. That, that's not the, sort of the way the thing works. Um, so I think the sort of the, where it works is if there's a clear agenda and you know what good looks like, you've got a good engaged um, minister, and you've got a department that is uh, generally open. I would say, before I just come on to the sort of final bit about cross going themes, I, I've been um, struck by how much the civil service have embraced the model in terms of found it useful. Um, having free grown-ups around the department that you can talk to is a very good thing on the whole. If anything, the one bit of advice I've been giving some of my um, uh, fellow directors, and it's nice to see a couple in the room uh, today, is uh, be a little bit careful that you don't go completely native, because the danger is you, you will be used for all sorts of interesting things, you know, interview people, do a report here, do something there, and before you know it, you're sort of, uh, sort of slightly sort of lost your, your true sense of independence. Because I think it's that triangular relationship that's so useful, because you, you can say things, uh, particularly as a non-exec, because I'm not trying to get elected, I'm not trying to get promoted in the civil service, and that's a fantastic position to be in. So the final area in terms of what we're doing, cross-cutting themes, is 90%, I reckon, um, from my time, of what the NEDs do is department-specific, because that's the nature. It's a part-time role. You can't easily sort of range around the whole rest of, of, gov of government. Um, and in places like DWP, you've got some really quite big issues and, and big departments. I mean, when I joined, it was 120,000 people. I think it's back down to 90. Is it 90? Less than 80, right? I mean, that was... Um, so what, a lot of what we spent our time on was how do you re massively reduce it but improve the engagement scores? And that was the sort of big push that uh, Robert Dever and I worked on uh, over a few years. Um, but the thing is, when we've got the non-execs together... And certainly what I do as a lead non-exec is sort of free headhunter for government, um, basically persuading the government to use boards and persuading people to come into the non-exec world, um, but also try and work out where the cross-cutting themes, where we can capture best practice and actually crack similar problems. So we, we've started with some common themes which John Brown um, came up with uh, originally. I've slightly refreshed it. We're on to probably sort of third iteration, iteration now. And I'll just briefly cover them just to sort of give you a sense of an out where the focus is. Um, the two ones that probably haven't changed in the entire time of the non-execs is talent and major projects. Because it's such a cross-civil service, cross-Whitehall issue. Uh, major projects now is in a very different place from where it was uh, seven years ago in terms of uh, the, both the training, the caliber of project management, and the control through the authority that is now there. Uh, and Tony Meggs is doing, a, I think, a, a great job of helping us you know, be very conscious of where the big delivery issues are in, in those projects. Um, but I think, again, we have to keep doing this because a lot of what government tries to achieve is through very big projects that, that have major stress points. And, uh, you know, the latest iteration for universal credit, for example, I'm sure is something that someone might mention. It's a bit of a history lesson for me because I was there when we redid the first delivery plan. Um, but I think those major projects will be a feature in government nowhere. And so understanding how you uh, monitor it, control it, staff it, resource it, and generally particularly get away from the good news culture that tends to pervade uh, is a really sort of continuing issue. Talent, um, we're now making real progress on the functional agenda in Whitehall. I think that is making a difference in obvious areas, but I think it's still got a long way to go. Um, but the arrival of real commercial talent, uh, real finance talent, and increasingly looking for specialist areas where we can basically grow the sort of talent pool that the service uh, definitely needs if it's going to particularly tackle the digital challenges going forward. And so we've had a, a cross uh, group, uh, cross departmental group led by Mervyn Walker, who leads uh, HMRC, who's doing continuing work on things like the uh, new Civil Service Academy and working very closely with Rupert on the people agenda for the civil service. And I think there's real. There's both real learning from the private sector in that area and real learning that we've seen of what works in some departments and what works in others. Um, but the, probably the latest iteration on the agenda is the third and final one, which is single departmental plans. I'll just sort of finish there because that is, I think, the first. We're now on the second and then arguably the third version, which is what we'll focus on late this year, early next year. 
which is the, probably the, the, the most important way in which a non-exec can help sort of both add value in the formation of the plan and then use the plan to track the performance and delivery of the department. One of the things when I walked into DWP that when I asked for the ball pack and was presented with this sort of six-foot stack of documents um, was it, the complete lack of any prioritization, any MI that you could understand, any real sense of how do you sort of check, ask what good looks like and then track it and make sure you've got the resources and the inputs to achieve an output. The STPs are not perfect, and this is the second iteration. I think the non-exec specifically will get involved in trying to get this next wave for next year uh, into really tight shape. But they do bring together the political objectives that were put in manifesto, the business as usual, and the change programs in one place. And as opposed to previous business plans from departments, which were much more laundry list, these are an attempt, and it's not the finished item, but every planning process I've ever seen is an annual cycle. It gets better the more people do it, and it gets better if you track it. So the departmental uh, SDPs are probably the key intervention, and the real point of that, which I want to finish on, is where the non-execs, I think, have got to focus now more than ever is prioritization. Um, political systems do not naturally prioritize. Politicians hate being told that they could do, if they want X, they'll have to drop Y because there's only sort of so many hours or so many bits in the day. Um, and naturally, politics and government is much more diffuse, complicated, and competing than the commercial world, which has got a relatively simple number of KPIs you can get your heads around, and, and ultimately is, 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 you know, relatively transparent. Government is much, much more diffuse, and anyone who comes in from the private sector and just says, well, I know how this works, let me tell you, uh, really misses the point, and, and is frankly patronizing. What is important, however, is that there is a serious attempt, particularly right now, during a Brexit process where the bandwidth in government plus the political situation in the government makes things extremely fragile. So right now, the biggest contribution a non-exec can make is to narrow down and understand the priorities of the department in order to improve the chances of delivery. Because that's ultimately what we're here to do. We're here to help departments plan better, uh, check that they've got the, uh, the performance management to track that sort of plan, and that they've got the capability to deliver that plan. But it all starts with the prioritization process. And STPs, I think, are a big innovation in government, uh, which will take time to, to get traction and will always fight with competing pressures like the bilaterals with Treasury, but I think are really important. And I think there are some things we can do to improve, but from the non-exec point of view, it gives you a unique way in to try to have an impact. And I think it's a very important area, uh, this precise next two-year period for the non-execs to play a role. Um, final, I should finish this with a word of thanks both to those that are here and those aren't, but the non-execs that I've had the privilege of working with have done a fantastic job in very different, and some, some cases, very difficult circumstances. Uh, I think for, for, for 90 plus percent of them, it's been a great experience and it's been a great way to contribute to uh, the nation and to government. And I think it has been and will continue to be a very valuable addition to the, to the machinery of government. Uh, providing we keep attracting the same level of talent that we've been able to do at the moment. And I think it is uh, something that I'm certainly seeing new, new volunteers coming through. I'm very confident about its contribution in the future. But uh, while I can waft at 30,000 feet and I don't actually have to do anything sort of grubby like sort of departments, I'm going to hand over uh, to, to Sarah, who is, uh, you know, for the second time of asking, right in the thick of a departmental role, and look forward to your questions in a minute. Thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you, Ian. Um, just to move your heads a little, I'm going to stand here. Um, yeah, as Ian's talked about some of the cross-cutting themes, and there's loads of stuff in there that I totally agree with, so I shall try not to completely duplicate what he's said. But I did think I might just drop down into a little bit more of, on a day-to-day -day basis, what we actually do in a department, how we attempt to make ourselves valuable. Um, because I think it's really important to register the thing that Ian said early on, which is fundamentally, non-executives in government have no remit. Um, it's not like being on a PLC board where you're elected by shareholders um, and you're re-elected or not re-elected if you do a good job. Um, in government, the politicians get elected to set policy frameworks and the civil servants then basically are responsible to parliament for the spending of the money to deliver the policy framework. That's, that's how accountability works. 
outside of that, the non-executives really are there, as, as Ian says, to advise. When I joined, when Ian joined, which was the back end of um, 2010, um, from, in my case, um, we were told by Lord Brown, who was our um, equivalent of Ian at that point, that these were advisory and supervisory boards. Um, now, as Ian's rightly said, each board works very differently depending on the Minister and the Secretary of State. My Minister at that stage was Eric Pickles, who most of you will know and picture. Um, now, anybody who knows Eric even slightly would know that supervising um, through the board was going to be quite a tough ask. Um, and quite quickly, we concluded that actually the right way was to make ourselves effective through expertise, support, advice, challenge, and being a point of reference and an external point of reference. Um, and I think he is absolutely right to say each board has developed itself in a way which reflects the nature of the business that the board does. DCLG was very much a policy department. DWP is very much a delivery department. We'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, and therefore, you have to cut your cloth accordingly. So you have to be adaptable and flexible. And basically, if you don't make yourself valuable, the ministerial board won't happen. Um, it won't even happen four or five times a year. It won't happen at all. Um, and you won't uh, have any access. So you won't be able to make a difference. So I think that, that sort of horses for courses is very much a theme that I've seen having worked in two different places. Um, so if we just drop down into DWP a little bit, um, I think one of the other things that's really interesting about about being in Whitehall is some of the organisations are, are really huge. DWP, as Ian said, has got fewer people now than it had before, but it's in, still in the uh, just under 80,000 people. So it's a very, very big department, has £180 billion pounds of budget, um, about half of which is about working age benefits and the other half of which is about retirement age benefits. So it's a very, very large operational department. And the sorts of issues that it's dealing with, of course, everybody will have read the papers. I'm sure we'll talk about the rollout of universal credit, which um, probably started back in 2010-ish and um, won't finish till 2022. So, you know, massive programs, uh, very long delivery agendas, but huge technology change and huge people change, both for the people who work for the department and indeed for the recipients of the benefits who are being asked to change their behaviour too. So there's a whole system change going on with universal credit which actually politicians won't have had much experience of having to do. Even the leaders in the civil service won't have done very often. So having external people who perhaps each had one of those experiences as well, probably triples or quadruples the experience around the table around how these programmes get delivered. So, so that's a typical example. But there are lots of other programmes, to, to Ian's point, um, about prioritisation. It's really difficult to get ministers to prioritise because each minister has a portfolio so we don't only look after universal credit. We have a big programme of activity moving disability living allowance into personal independence payments for people who are disabled. A lot of work with employers um, about getting them disability confidence so that they can employ more disabled people. We run the child maintenance group. Um, we're doing work with Scotland on devolution because they're going to have to make some decisions for themselves about benefits, but we're still going to run their systems. Um, and indeed, we're in charge of auto enrolment and, and NEST, which many of you will recognise as employers. Um, and those contributions began up from 4 to 8% in April, which you probably know about. And that will derive a whole series of, of, of operational challenges. So, and it's not easy in a department for the minister to say, that's fine, I'll do working age benefits, but I'm not going to worry about pensions today, and I'm not going to worry about child maintenance, and I'm not going to worry about disabilities, because actually all those constituents are very important, they're all voters, um, and they're all citizens. So actually that job of prioritisation, I think, in a business world where you're used to saying, here's my list of 100 activities, top to bottom, the finance director comes along and goes, well, you can only have this much money, you go right down to 67, we do, everything else we forget. Um, actually, you can't do that in government because actually your manifesto has covered a lot of ground, you've made a series of promises. So actually, it's partly about how do you square that circle? And I, and I know that in my early days, I talked to ministers about prioritisation and they slightly looked at me as if I was living on a different planet, which I think from their point of view, I probably was. Um, but actually, what we now do is we try to say, OK, so let's at least try and get some sort of pecking order says these are the things that we absolutely have to do quickly. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. Spotted. Thank you. Um, so here are the things we have to do quickly. 
um, and we need to put a lot of resource on and put tight timetables against. And here are some things that actually we can resource less proactively that we can do over a longer period of time. But it's not about prioritization and a long list and cutting off. So you have to um, be willing to be flexible in the way you work. So how do we engage with ministers? How do we have any influence at all? Well, I guess fundamentally, um, as Ian said, we have ministerial boards chaired by the Secretary of State, Eric to his credit, and DCLG chaired everyone, apart from when he was worrying about flooding and standing in for another Secretary of State's uh, role. But he broadly chaired those. And they are primarily about keeping the operation of the triumvirate of non-exec civil servants and ministers in the same triangle, keeping us all attached. And particularly for the NEDs, it's very important for it to be evident that the Secretary of State thinks that having NEDs is a worthwhile thing to do and that he's prepared to put time into having those meetings. Because if he doesn't, the very strong signal it sends is that you're not adding any value. And if, if that message is sent, then even if the Permanent Secretary is engaged, actually through the organisation, you won't get much traction. So you do that four or five times a year. Um, but actually, that's by far the least important thing you do. That's a scene setter, really. Um, beyond that, you do a lot of stuff with the executive team, subcommittees. Ian talked about people as a big subcommittee. Dave Lister that Ian mentioned chaired a technology advisory group in DWP because actually the technology program is very big. Um, but also you do a lot of individual project work um, and indeed you do a lot of mentoring. So people selection at the senior level is very an important part of what you do. So I'm just about to be part of the um, panel to, to recruit the new permanent secretary at DWP because Robert's all right, announced that he's going to retire. I did the same at DCLG. I took, uh, took part in the panels that appointed quite a lot of the DGs, which is the next level down, um, and indeed the, the uh, CEOs of the arm's length bodies. So, so actually part of the influence you have is by helping the departments to choose the right people to do the big jobs, because we all know that choosing the right people makes a big difference to what gets delivered. Um, and myself, I went off and chaired uh, one of the arm's length bodies at uh, DCLG. So there are lots and lots of ways of getting involved. It's quite ambiguous. There's nothing written down. But actually, you make your own weather, in a sense. Um, and the lead non-exec clearly does um, quite a bit of that shaping for the non-exec team. Um, so I guess you just um, have to be pretty patient. I suppose that would be my a couple of things you know, that, that I would observe as having been outside and then inside, one of which is you need to be patient. Um, things take time. Um, these are big operations, and they don't change immediately. Um, and I think the second thing you have to understand is that there is a complexity about the stakeholder map which there isn't in business. And I've worked in some quite big businesses. But actually, the line from the top to the bottom is quite straight. And yes, you take people with you. But broadly speaking, pull a lever at the top and stuff happens. Um, government isn't quite like that. And understanding the complexity of that stakeholder map and who, who has a point of view and who needs to be corralled um, is a really important part of whether you can deliver successfully or not. So you know, that would be my summary. I, I think it's been worth it. Um, in fact, I came back after five years of of Eric um, says that it's, it's definitely worth it and uh, DWP certainly has plenty to keep us busy.